Okay, welcome everyone. Let's get this started. Um, welcome again, and then really thank you for joining this um, Vega seminar number six and the last one in this Vega 21 series. Um, my name is Simon Rue. I'm the lead of the viral genomics group at JGI, and mostly here I'm representing the group of uh, scientists who were co organizer of this Vega meeting, Vega 21. Um, and again, welcoming you and thanking you for joining us uh, to this live stream today. Um, Today, we have a very exciting seminar uh, where we are starting, or not starting, but we are at the end of our pivot. We, starting, we, we started with talking a lot about viral diversity and exploring this viral diversity. And now we are going all the way towards, let's try to um, use this knowledge about viral diversity and see what viruses can do for us, literally. Um, so again, Two, two great speakers and flash talks in between. I think most of you have been here in previous Vega seminars, so you know how this will be organized. We have this webinar right now, and this will be followed by a breakout session. So I strongly encourage you if you have um, any questions or if you want to chat with the speakers to join us in the um, follow-up breakout session uh, on this separate Zoom meeting. Um, during this webinar, one thing to note is um, if you want to ask questions right now, you can do this, but you have to type them in through the Q&A and we will try to address uh, a number of these questions after each talk. Again, the majority of the question we expect will be handled in, in the breakout session afterwards. And with that, and without further delay, I will hand it over to um, Vivek Mudalik to introduce the first speaker. Um, thanks, Simon. Um... Welcome everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our uh, first speaker, uh, Professor David Bride. Uh, he's from uh, Department of Pathology at UCSD, University of California, San Diego. Uh, and his research focuses primarily on human microbiome and human virome, uh, and also studies of phage and bacteria interactions in the context of uh, phage therapy. And the title of his talk today is The Role of Bacteriophages in Human Microbiome. Take it away, David. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's really a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the work that my research laboratory has been doing. First, looking a little bit at the ecology of phages, and then uh, to talk about some of the things that we've been doing over the course of the past few years to try to understand what is the role primarily of bacteriophages uh, in the human microbiome. So our laboratory is fairly diverse. We do a lot of work on the microbiome, looking at bacteria in the microbiome. Uh, uh, primarily, we have been a virome lab over the years. Uh, and recently, we've been transitioning more into bacteriophage therapy. But the human virome really is, is our first love. And it's something that we've been working on very specifically because we haven't been looking at any environmental uh, virums, it's just all been human virum uh, analysis. And we noted very early on that there's a ton of bacteria in the human body. Uh, there's about 38 trillion of them. And we estimate that there's at least 10 times as many viruses, <clears throat> most of which are bacteriophages that also inhabit the human body. And basically wherever you look in the human body, uh, sites that have a lot of bacteria, sites that have very few of any bacteria, we're able to find bacteriophages. So they're really quite ubiquitous uh, in the human body. And we see our uh, primary goal is trying to figure out what all of these bacteriophages that inhabit the human body are actually doing. Um, so as I said, we're a microbiome laboratory. We do work on the bacterial side uh, a bit as well. And we ask a lot of questions as uh, many others who work on the bacterial microbiome, such as, for example, what bacteria constitute the microbiome? What do they do in different parts of the body? How do they respond to different disturbances? And ultimately, what is the role of these uh, viruses uh, in terms of promoting uh, human health and how might we manipulate them to promote human health? Well, we ask all of those same questions. We just try to do so from a virus centric perspective. And that's uh, a lot of uh, what I'll be trying to demonstrate uh, to you all today. And you know, while there are many questions over the years that we have asked about the human virome, Really, the primary one that we are asking right now is really how do we measure 
the effects of viruses uh, in the uh, in these human microbial communities. I wish it was a trivial question because it's taken us quite a few years uh, to really get our footing trying to understand how we might do that. But I'm going to present to you guys a couple of approaches that we started to take that we think uh, really are starting to pay off. So as I mentioned, we started off mainly as a, a viral ecology laboratory, and we did many studies uh, really just trying to describe and understand uh, what the viruses are uh, in the human body and how they're uh, basically arranged uh, in different individuals. And one of the earlier studies that we did, uh, I'm showing you here, which we basically called the campus study, uh, where we basically took individuals and their roommates as they moved in together uh, on a college campus and just kind of asked very basic questions. We looked at their saliva, we looked at their feces, uh, and just asked, can we tell people apart? Uh, and it turns out, uh, I assume most of you guys are, uh, are familiar with these principal coordinates type of analyses. Yes, the, uh, we can tell individuals apart by looking at their viral. And not only can we tell them apart looking at their mouth or looking at, at their uh, uh, gut viral, uh, but at every single time point, because we did this study longitudinally over the course of six months. And what we find is that our viruses basically start to paint a picture of who we are. So you gain a much better understanding of, of the viruses that inhabit an individual by looking at that individual over time. But at the same time, you can tell exactly who that individual is over time. This is something that we believe would serve as a great forensic technique. It just is unfortunately way too expensive and way too cumbersome to actually try as a forensic technique, but it works extraordinarily well. We've never found someone that we can identify just on the singular basis of looking at the viruses that inhabit their viral. In that exact same study though, we did something interesting. Um, again, we looked at individuals and their unrelated housemates as they moved in together uh, on college campuses. And not only did we find that we could tell exactly who you are, but we could tell exactly who you lived with as well. And that, that, that actually was the main purpose of doing the study, but we were happy that it uh, seemed to work out uh, that way as well. In every single case, it's not as obvious because uh, these are uh, uh, images that we would much rather be in 3D, but here they're uh, just in 2D. Um, but you can tell exactly who an individual is and you can tell exactly who they're living with. Um, and while I'm not showing you the statistics, uh, in most every household is highly statistically significant um, uh, that uh, there are viruses uh, or, or patterns of viruses within those households. Uh, it turns out that, that we see those patterns of viruses because viruses are shared between individuals. And you know, uh, while uh, it's simpler for, to think of them as being contagious. Um, maybe they're not uh, contagious in the classically way you might think of say an influenza or SARS-CoV-2 uh, in terms of being uh, contagious, but absolutely just living with someone, you don't even have to spend that much time with them, but just living with someone, you are going to share the viruses in your mouth and your gut um, as a result of inhabiting uh, the same uh, location over that period of time. One of the other things that we've been very interested in understanding just in terms of the ecology uh, of the virome really is, is how viromes compare with one another. And do we see particular patterns uh, within viromes? So as I had mentioned, our lab has been very prolific in terms of analyzing viromes. And one of the things that we've done that I think is a fairly good thing uh, is that we have used the exact same techniques in most of our studies. And while we have changed those techniques recently, um, we've got a large cadre of viromes that were all analyzed using the exact same techniques. And what that allows us to do is to be able to compare each of these sample types with one another. So for example, we've looked at saliva, dental plaque, uh, feces, urine, breast milk, cerebral spinal fluid uh, uh, as well. Uh, and we wanted to really compare uh, to understand, do we start to see patterns emerging uh, within uh, these viromes? And 
absolutely, we see some sort of body site specific features uh, of some of these viromes. Now, uh, the caveat is that obviously, if we examined even more body sites, maybe these wouldn't be body site specific. But of the sample types that we've looked at, for example, so when we look at feces, we find a lot of microviruses. We don't find microviruses anywhere other than uh, in human feces. When we look in saliva, we find a lot of cyphoviruses. Um, when we look in the urine, we start to see herpes viruses. Uh, uh, quite a bit. When we look in body fluids, like say your gallbladder fluid or your joint fluid, we start to find a lot of inoviruses, which we don't tend to find a lot of in other places. And when we look at breast milk, for example, we find a lot of myoviruses. So uh, again, there's patterns that start to emerge as we examine uh, these viromes. And while we don't fully know the importance of it. Uh, it's great for those of us really interested in ecology to understand that there are some features that will help us understand what body site we're looking at, um, even if we don't know exactly what body site uh, that is. The other thing that starts to emerge are patterns when we look at it through some of these uh, uh, somewhat simple principal coordinates analyses, are that some body sites are related to uh, to each other in ways that uh, I don't know, maybe some people might not predict. Uh, so for example, looking at uh, this and so, you know, panels A and B are basically the same, just one shows uh, principal coordinate three and the other shows principal coordinate two. Um, and it's actually not properly labeled, uh, but A is two and B is three. Um, so uh, uh, for example, we see feces, urine and saliva all sort of uh, uh, together along the x-axis of these uh, of these plots, indicating that they're actually uh, quite similar uh, to one another. And then when we look at the other side, uh, we find, for example, plasma, breast milk, body fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, um, all sort of cluster relatively closely together uh, on these graphs. And you can almost draw a line right down the center, sort of bifurcating uh, these uh, these plots where it looks like you You've got uh, one set of viromes on one side, the other set on the other side, um, uh, with the uh, breast milk uh, looking like it's sitting somewhere uh, in between. And we see that trend if we look at alpha diversity in these viromes as well, which is in essence sort of a measure of how many viruses are present and how they're uh, distributed. And, and we see again, saliva, urine, and feces uh, all together uh, sort of clustering in this high diversity complex. If we look at the uh, uh, the other viromes, um, it, and we see breast milk, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, blood plasma, other body fluids, uh, all together in these relatively low diversity uh, complex. So we have a high and a low diversity uh, uh, complex, which is similar to what we basically just observed uh, on the uh, uh, PCLA plot. If we look at what's homologous uh, between these different sample types, we see the same trend yet again. Um, so for example, uh, when we look for uh, ho highly homologous, we use the term shared here, um, but it, it's really just highly homologous uh, bacteriophages in these sample types, um, you'll see that you know, urine shares a lot with feces, which shares a lot with saliva. We see that saliva shares a lot with feces and which shares a lot with urine, uh, et cetera. Again, you could almost draw the exact same bifurcating line uh, between uh, uh, the two groups. Uh, uh, they, they are just uh, so different. Uh, and we see the exact same trend. For example, if we look at cerebral spinal fluid, uh, we see that it, it's sharing a lot with blood plasma uh, and other uh, uh, body fluids uh, as well. So um, we have a high diversity and a low diversity complex. And we think that they represent these ecological clusters uh, where they're sort of either shared or highly homologous uh, viruses uh, within uh, each of these uh, two groups. And the most obvious thing that we see that sort of bifurcates them is in general body sites that have a lot of bacteria like your mouth, like your bladder, like your gut, um, they tend to have, quite frankly, a lot of viruses as well. Uh, and other body sites that tend not to have a lot of bacteria, like for example, your cerebral spinal fluid and your blood, I mean, those body sites better not have a lot of, uh, of bacteria there. And they tend to be in these low diversity uh, uh, complexes. Right around the same time that we uh, published this work, one of our collaborators, Jeremy Barr and his group, uh, demonstrated that some of these uh, viruses can actively transcytose 
across, uh, for example, your mu mucosal layers uh, in your body. And what we believe is happening is that some of these body sites like cerebral spinal fluid, et cetera, we're getting active transitosis of viruses into these areas. Um, but for them, particularly because most of them are bacteriophages, it's likely just a dead end because if there's no bacterial host there uh, for them to infect, then the virus has gotten there, but there's nothing that, that it can do outside of just decay uh, once it has gotten there. So we're really interested in moving from the ecology that we've done for close to the past 10 years uh, towards uh, understanding uh, really how we can understand the effects of bacteriophages on our microbiome. And one study that we did with my uh, PhD mentor, uh, Martin Blazer, I think is what really started to push us in this particular uh, direction. So he's got this really nice model um, uh, of, of mice. And, uh, you know, I, this, I know this is a busy slide. I would only pay attention to the uh, fact that we take young mice, we feed them normal diets up until about 16 weeks, and then we transition them to high fat diets. And the large question that we had is, well, what happens when we transition them to a diet? Are we seeing uh, significant differences in their viromes uh, or not? Uh, basically, uh, one might predict that you might see some significant differences, but we certainly didn't know what to expect uh, when we did uh, this study. And what we found uh, looking at both the bacteria and the viruses is that absolutely we could tell who was on a high fat diet and who was on a normal uh, child diet. Uh, just taking a look at the right side over here on panel B, looking at the bacteria, you can see a huge shift as we get to week 16, where all of these uh, viromes uh, on high fat diet or all of the bacteria on high fat diet look different. And that's something that we've known from many studies before. Um, with the viruses, because we're specifically doing metagenomics, we get a little bit better definition than we do with 16S. And we also see certain patterns. Uh, 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 for example, week four, we can see the viruses. We can see them shift in week five. We can see them uh, shift into what I believe is week 14 or 15. Uh, and then once we uh, change their diets, uh, we see a really radical change. Uh, the virums end up in this state all the way to week 28, uh, where they have uh, uh, completely uh, been changed. And what we find uh, that is sort of the mediator of the changes that we see uh, in the in the virome is that uh, in mice on sort of normal child, child diets, what we normally see in the gut is a whole lot of cycloviruses. This is the exact same thing we see uh, in humans. But, but what we see is as we transition them to high fat diets, those cyphoviruses viruses appear to be replaced with microviruses. So that's a big and significant change. We also find some other significant changes. So for example, we find a lot of eukaryote uh, viruses, uh, uh, as well in these mice that are on high fat diets, but we specifically focus mainly on the uh, bacteriophages that are present. So seeing that study, it sort of uh, got us to ask the question, basically kind of what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Um, so in this case, what's coming first? Are the bacterial communities changing or the virus communities changing and then sort of forcing changes in the bacterial communities as a result? Um, and while the uh, answer might seem obvious, it, I mean, it even seemed obvious to me before we did these sorts of studies, we still don't fully know, um, but it, it sort of really leads us to try to understand, okay, what can these viruses really do? So I'll sort of end talking a little bit about the model systems, because one of the things that we, we're really interested in, again, we're interested in the human viral. Um, and uh, one of the things that we want to know is how do, does the fact that we've all got our own indigenous phage communities affect these viral transfers? Um, so what we ideally want is a model system that not only has our bacteria, but also has our phages in it as well, so that we can see what happens if we take somebody else's phages and we put it into us. Um, and that's uh, uh, something that we've been working on for, for quite some time and are unfortunately, or, or more fortunately, finally getting those uh, sorts of things uh, to, work, to work out. And we've been working with Emma 
Bob Verco up at um, uh, the University of Guelph. She's got this wonderful robo gut system that they call uh, chemostats um, that, you know, you can control the pH, you can control the nutrients. Uh, and it turns out you can put feces into these artificial culture systems. And after about 28 uh, to 30 days, what comes out the other end from a microbiological standpoint looks a lot like feces. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons we don't use the term uncultivable anymore, because a lot of the organisms that we thought we couldn't culture turn out they grow just fine if you give them enough time in systems like these chemostat uh, culture systems. We actually thought to ourselves, these systems probably work so well, they're probably reproducing our virons as well. Um, so, uh, um, uh, so uh, we, we looked and we saw there's tons of viruses uh, present uh, in these systems. When we look at them over the course of uh, 28 days, by the time they reach day 28, uh, or these, this is actually day 24, uh, day 24, um, the viromes look remarkably like the viromes of feces. Uh, and in fact, we can reproduce that individual specific nature that we find uh, in our fecal viromes as well, just by growing our own feces in a test tube. Uh, it turns out the viruses start to bloom. Um, so we feel like this is a great system as well uh, for uh, initiating transfers of viruses uh, between uh, individuals. And we've been using it to take one individual's viruses, put them into another's uh, system uh, to understand what are the impacts uh, on that system. And I don't have the data to show you, but uh, the one thing I can tell you for certain is they definitely do impact. So just in summary, we know that the human body has a lot of uh, viral communities. We know that there's these high diversity and low diversity clusters uh, that we largely see based on the number of bacteria uh, that are present uh, in the same body sites. We know that these phages uh, between individuals are shared uh, and transmissible. Um, and uh, we know that high fat diets can affect mice significantly, and that viruses may be sufficient to drive these lean and obese phenotypes, and they certainly drive differences in the bacterial microbiome. And lastly, we've got these model communities uh, that we can utilize to uh, understand what are the downstream effects of phage-mediated transfers in the human microbiome. So with that, I will end by just acknowledging all the folks who did most of this work in our funding sources. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. This is fantastic, fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple. Of, we have time for a few questions. Uh, if you have questions, please enter them in Q and A um, tab there. Um, to start off, David, I think I have a simple one question. In initially, the campus study, I was very intrigued by that. Uh, which of those are signature ones? One is viruses or the microbes. Which one are giving the signature pattern? in the campus community? Well, in, in fact, you can get a signature from just from looking at the bacteria as well. Um, but because we did the bacteria via 16S and we did the viruses via metagenomics, the signature was much more reproducible and much more robust for the viruses. And that may just be an artifact of the, of the fact that we did them uh, via metagenomics rather than another method. Fantastic. Oh, we have one question coming in. Um, so they, it says, I noticed there was a significant increase in Mimiviride on one of your slides. Do you think this is an artifact? Yes, uh, we absolutely, we, we don't think that there are Mimi viruses there. And the reason that we don't think there's Mimi viruses there is that our techniques are a little biased, um, which is why we've, we're trying to get away from what we typically do, which is cesium chloride gradient centrifugation and uh, uh, filtration. Uh, and that's that we filter out the big stuff. And part of the big stuff uh, uh, are giant viruses such as Mimi viruses. So it's unlikely that we have Mimi viruses there. It's likely that we have some kits to Mimi viruses just because they're so large. And in any virome study, if you look closely enough, there's going to be hits to, uh, to Mimi viruses. Just remember that when you set your sort of expect score based on the number of reads, you're going to end up with some random hits to Mimi viruses and other things as well. Cool. Um, one more question here. Um, is there any uh, proposed mechanism for how transferring phages or viruses drive the mouse phenotype? And is there any risk or odds that some metabolites may be co-transferred? 
Yeah. Um, so uh, we don't think that it's a metabolite uh, uh, issue. And part of it is that how we purify the viruses out. Um, you know, we do, um, and I'm forgetting, you know, we use, we do these PEG precipitations. We're basically getting rid of just about everything that was in there. Um, uh, so um, it would be really hard for it to be you know, a set of uh, metabolites that are doing this, it's much more likely to be the viruses. And on top of that, we can demonstrate that the viruses are changing significantly uh, the constituents of the bacterial microbiome uh, in these subjects. So we, we do believe that this is true biology that's uh, likely independent of, uh, of the presence of, uh, of metabolites uh, in these subjects. Did I fully answer that or is there a part I missed? Yeah, I think it is from Simon. Simon, you have be you okay with it? Yeah, I can actually unmute. Um, yeah, no, that's was like just the effect seems so great that I'm sure like first thing that came to your mind is just let's try to rule out everything that it like everything else than phages. But it makes sense that if they are precipitated with peg and everything, yeah, it, it has to be the viruses. That's yeah, so and cool. it, yeah, and I, and I would say you know we went through a lot of work to make certain that these phage preparations were pure. <laughs> Uh, you know, because obviously if you get, you know, some bacteria in those phage preparations, then, you know, that could easily explain why, you know, the microbiomes of these mice change. Mm -hmm. um, David, I had this question about the sample because you're handling all of these different sources of the samples. Is there sample preparation is different from all of them? Or is there any, uh, this is related to the sample question that earlier had. Yeah. What, what are the challenges that you think standardization? Oh, they, they, I mean, there's a lot of challenges, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, we, you know, we don't have time to talk about all the challenges. Uh, um, but we do try to do just about the same thing for all of our sample types. Um, so in other words, uh, with the cesium chloride gradient uh, density centrifugation, we're really trying to uh, one centrifuge down the big stuff, then filter out the rest of the big stuff, and then chew up uh, you know, naked DNA uh, and hope that in the end, what we end up with are bacteriophages. That stuff works really well when you're looking at feces, when you're looking at saliva, uh, even when you're looking at urine. Turns out it doesn't work nearly as well when you're looking at uh, low diversity uh, uh, body sample types like the CSF. It took us years to figure out what the viruses were in CSF just because it's, it's way too easy to get contamination. Fantastic. Um, I think that is all we had the questions for. Thank you so much for a great talk. I really enjoyed um, handing over to Simon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And yes, we will just go ahead and um, let's see. Here we go. Here we go. And now this will be time for some flash talks. Um, and first one is um, Kelly William from Livermore. Thanks, Simon. So um, I'll describe a new class of mobile DNA. It's a satellite that integrates directly into its helper phage genome. So a typical satellite phage, of course, needs gene products from its helper phage. And the pair have other genetic interactions that control each other's replication and transcription. And these interactions are all in trans because their genomes integrate at separate sites in the bacterial chromosome. These new satellites are helper embedded. They integrate within their own helper and we call them HESs. This configuration sets up new replication and transcription interactions that are in cis rather than the typical trans interactions. Also, when we discover a HES bioinformatically, this embedding lets us immediately discover its helper. And this co-discovery is a benefit to developing new vectors because for a typical satellite, we don't immediately know who its helper is. HESs are close relatives of the uh, phage-inducible chromosomal islands, which have plenty of room to carry genes of interest and be converted into useful vectors. So our discovery started with our bioinformatic tools for mapping genomic islands that are notable for mapping with nucleotide precision. And the first test we found was integrated into a late gene, the capsid gene of a normal prophage that is very similar to lambda. So in this experiment in the lower left, we induced that bacterial strain with mitomycin and monitored the integration sites of the helper and the HES. And I'll just summarize. First, the entire combined helper HES circle excises 
And then that whole thing replicates. So now we're presumably in the helper's late developmental phase and the HES excises from the circle at that time, but doesn't replicate on its own. So we see passive replication of the HES driven by the helper in cysts. And finally, we use the integrase sequence to search for more HESs and found hundreds of them. All were in prophage late genes, but at many different site types. So each is a true site specificity that forms a different subclade in an integrase phylogenetic tree. The remarkable thing is that this whole clade of integrases keeps finding new sites, but always with this tropism for phage late genes. So all these Hesses have their genes co-oriented with the helper late genes. So that shows a second new cis interaction, Hess transcription that's driven by the helper late promoter. So to summarize, this new satellite type tells us immediately who its helper is, which lets us more quickly develop it as a vector. And it has new regulatory interactions where the helper directly in cis drives satellite replication and transcription. Thank you. Really cool, thank you. And next one is Ali. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, we all know that uh, phages are regulating the bacteria uh, house and, uh, but there is a lot of unknown. Uh, we don't know uh, real mechanisms where they are uh, doing these uh, changes. So uh, for looking into those uh, mechanisms, we have uh, studied uh, Cetinobacter baumani, a top priority pathogens uh, uh, interactions with uh, its phage, it's a C4L phage, nearly isolated. Uh, we have looked into different characteristics of this phage and uh, we have used these uh, different characteristics for uh, designing or multi-omics approach then, uh, which has been used uh, to look into these unknown uh, mechanisms. So uh, through these uh, different ohms, we have uh, found out that phages are uh, actively changing uh, and significantly changing uh, the physiology of the house. And uh, these changes are uh, mainly uh, treatment and also time specific. Uh, we also have uh, identified over 100 metabolites uh, that are phage, uh, which are specific to phage infections. Uh, we further did a multi-omics factor analysis uh, through these analyzes, we have uh, shown that uh, most of these uh, heterogeneities are coming from transcriptomes, uh, followed by uh, proteome and metabolome data. And uh, we get interested into uh, looking further into uh, the transcriptomes data, and we have done uh, differential sec analysis, uh, which where we have seen that most of these uh, changes on the genes are uh, re related to metabolisms, defense mechanisms, and also many of those are with unknown functions. Uh, so we are looking for there these, uh, to, into these genes that uh, we don't know what uh, function they might encode. And we are hoping to find uh, novel uh, antibacterials or also uh, we are interested to shed some light of the unknown uh, mechanisms behind the interactions of phages and bacteria. So uh, that was all, thanks for hearing. Right, thank you. Next one is Chris. Hi, so a few months ago, I was uh, asking myself uh, this question of which prophages in a metagenome are active. And specifically, I wanna know if I found integrated prophages, were they active or were they dormant in my samples? And if you look at the, the figure down here, just an example of um, what I was thinking about is, uh, you have uh, different stages of infection for a prophage where a prophage can um, be integrated in a lysogenic stage where it's more or less dormant. And then um, from some form of activation, it can uh, trigger genome replication and go into the normal lysis cycle. And if you have an active prophage population, um, there's active uh, replication, active lysis, and um, a, a big impact on its host population but a dormant prophage population will not have the same effect and there's typically no lysis. And this is certainly a question that other people have asked before, but I couldn't find any mechanism or um, benchmark study that was able to um, give, give a clear 
yes or no on activity for prophages and metagenome. Um, so I uh, wrote this tool called Propagate, um, which is a prophage activity estimator, and it uses read coverage from short reads in metagenomes to identify if a prophage is active or not. And um, there's some caveats of it that I can talk about in my poster, but um, one interesting thing, um, if you look at the, the last two bullet points over uh, on the top left, is that I found that a surprisingly few number of prophages were active um, in my samples, which was um, a little bit different than what I saw in the literature. Um, but what was more interesting was that there was specific prophage populations, at least in some of the metagenomes that I checked, where you could find the prophages in almost all of the samples, but they were very habitat specific. So these weren't human samples, but if you looked at specific habitats, those were the only ones where those prophages were active, even if you could find them everywhere. Um, so if you're interested in looking at prophage activity, uh, you can check out my poster. Thanks. Cool, thanks. Okay, next one is Miguel. Hi everyone, um, I'm Michaeline Albright and today I'm going to give you a um, quick look at some new exciting data that we have uh, looking at the impact of soil viruses on carbon cycling. So to directly test the hypothesis that increasing viral abundance would alter microbially driven carbon cycling dynamics, we manipulated viral abundance in microcosm experiments with complex litter decomposer communities. And so in our microcosms, we had uh, sterilized sand and blue gramma litter, and we added a complex microbial community extracted from soils. And then in our virus addition treatment, we added a viral fraction extracted from the same soils, which we estimated um, added about a 30 fold addition. We then had an additional treatment where we, all, where we added um, a killed viral fraction. So this uh, viral fraction had been autoclaved since we were adding significant amounts of organic matter residuals from the soil. And so we measured respiration um, over time and we had two different soils. And over the first week, we see this nutrient effect in both the plus virus and plus virus killed treatments. Um, however, then from weeks, between weeks two and four, we start to see these significant differences in our plus virus versus the plus virus killed treatment or this virus effect in the PJ soil um, on the left, but not in the SF soil on the right. Um, so we're seeing this virus effect in one soil, but not the other. We also looked at some other um, components of carbon and nutrient cycling, including dissolved organic carbon and total nitrogen. Um, and so this PCA plot is showing that there are also differences between the plus virus and the plus virus killed treatments um, in our two different soils. And um, but we see that the magnitude of differences are much larger in the PJ than in the SF soil. And so then finally going to the right, one reason for these differences between our two soils may be that we have differences in the diversity or abundance of viruses in the two initial soils. And so we sequenced the viromes of the initial samples that we used to create the microbial inoculum and we found a large number of viral contigs in the PJ compared to the SF soil, even though we had similar sequencing depth. And so overall, using really complex microbial communities in this model terrestrial microcosm system, um, we're showing that increasing viral abundance can impact terrestrial carbon and nutrient cycling, but that it's potentially context dependent and I'd be happy to go into more details or talk further with anyone in the follow-up session. Thanks. Nice, thank you. And the last one uh, is Nikhil. So thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity. Hi everyone, today I'd like to talk to you about virus-host interactions in a municipal landfill. 
So we have a landfill which we sampled in southern Ontario. We collected samples first in 2016, and we since resampled it in 2017. DNA was extracted from filtered biomass and sent to the JGI for sequencing. We generated our metagenomes, and then those metagenomes were binned into MEGs, or metagenome assembled genomes. To do this, we used Concoct, Metabat2, and MaxBin2, along with DOS tool. And we annotated viruses in our metagenomes using virus order. We then linked, we then linked our viruses to our hosts um, through viral protospacer to host CRISPR spacer matches. And from this, we were able to visualize these virus host networks, one of which is at the top right of this slide. This is for our 2016 data, and I've stripped the labels away for the sake of simplicity. I want to draw your attention to the top left of this network, where there's a cluster of four viruses and two hosts in particular. And each of the viruses, the, sorry, the edges connecting virus nodes, which are in diamonds, to the host nodes, which are in circles, are weighted in thickness by how many CRISPR spacers from the host CRISPR array match to segments of the viral element. In the case of these four viruses, there's anywhere from 23 to 48 spacer to virus um, viral element matches. We then kept the 2016 virus data set the same, but we wanted to see how they were targeted by hosts from our 2017 data. And when we did this, we found something quite interesting. These same four viruses are again, hyper-targeted by the 2017 hosts. And this time we have anywhere from 33 to 65 CRISPR spacer to viral protospacer matches. We've taken one of these representative hyper-targeted viruses along with its annotations and depicted at the bottom right of this slide. And what I want to point out is that the top two hosts, we have our, sorry, we have our CRISPR spacer targeting profiles. Our top two hosts have similar targeting profiles, despite them being from different time points, different phyla, and from different sample sites. In the same way, the bottom two hosts have similar targeting profiles to one another. They're from different time points, they're from different phyla, they're from the same sample site. The regions targeted by these CRISPR spacers are mostly, or the strongest targeted regions, are hypothetical protein coding regions that have no annotations and reference databases. Suggest that these, this targeting might be selected for because these regions are important in viral replication in ways we may not understand. We hope to use these virus networks as a framework to understand how viruses are impacting the biogeochemistry and ecology of our system of study through the mortality that they're inducing upon their hosts. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, that's fascinating. Okay. And that was it for the flash talks for today. Thanks for, uh, or thanks to all the speakers. I, I guess I say this every time, but if you ever, you know, if you have never done this kind of flash talks, um, these are not easy to prepare. It's really not that straightforward to just distill down your message to something that is understandable in less than one or two minutes. So really great work, everyone. Uh, really enjoyable and. And again, thank you to all of you. And marginally, you know, just a big thank you to all the Flash Talk presenters throughout all of these Vega seminars. And with this, I will hand it over to Vivek for the second um, talk of the day. Um, thanks, Simon. Finally, uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Karen Maxwell. She's from uh, Department of Biochemistry, University of Toronto. Uh, research group works on group works on phage host interactions, antiphage mechanisms, and then phage mediated bacterial virulence mechanisms, and all cool stuff. So I'm so excited to um, be here. Take it away, Ken. Great. Thanks very much, Vivek, for the introduction, and, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. So I'm going to talk to you about some work today ongoing in my lab that's actually exploring the dark matter or all the hypothetical genes that are in phage genomes. And, you know, I took this, uh, the title of today's session, pretty liber uh, literally. So it's leveraging viral impacts and really thinking about what can phages do for us. So of course, um, phages have led to the development of really important, or studies of phage host interactions have led to the development of really important uh, biotechnological tools. Restriction enzymes and CRISPR-Cas, of course, were discovered as phage resistance mechanisms, immune systems in bacteria, and they've enabled modern molecular biology and modern genome editing. And also, uh, you know, phages have mechanisms to overcome and fight back against these bacterial immune systems. So an example of that is anti-CRISPRs. And they're being developed, uh, they inactivate CRISPR-Cas systems, they're being developed uh, as off switches for CRISPR genome editing uh, in lots of different types of cells, mammalian cells and others. And phages also, uh, in the last few years, there's been a, a huge resurgence in interest in using them as therapeutics. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of this is thanks to Stephanie Strathdee's work. Um, 
you know, a number of years ago, she had a, a very highly publicized because it was well controlled clinical, well, not clinical trial, but uh, phage treatment, phage therapy treatment on her husband. And, and so when we're thinking about using phages uh, in these kinds of treatments, we really need to be thinking about um, all of the genes that are in them, both from the point of view of knowing which genes are perhaps bad to be using in these phage therapies, but also knowing how can we engineer these phages to be able to come over things, to overcome things like bacterial immune systems. And so phages have, uh, the type of phages that my lab works on are known as temperate phages, and there's two different lifestyles. And so when we're thinking about all of the unknown genes that are present in these phages, we really need to be thinking about both of these lifestyles. So the phage, when it infects the cell, can choose to enter the lytic cycle. It hijacks the host cell machinery and uh, produces copies of itself and lyses the cell to release them. But the phage can also choose to enter what's known as the lysogenic cycle. And typically uh, during lysogeny, the phage is integrated into the bacterial chromosome into a form known as a prophage. And then it's passively replicated by the bacterial cell. And because the phage is now living in this symbiotic relationship with the bacterial host that it's, that it's uh, inside of, they uh, typically can encode genes that actually increase the survival of the bacterial host. And so when, when we think about um, different uh, obstacles that phages have to overcome to replicate during lytic cycle and, and the types of uh, genes that they need to encode, of course, the first thing they have to do is hijack the host cell machinery. So they, you know, they encode their own viral proteins and some replication proteins, but they also need to co-opt proteins from the bacterial host. So examples of this are from phage lambda, replication protein P and NIN B that, that uh, bring in the host uh, helicase and host recombination machinery to allow the phage to propagate. Bacterial defense systems also provide a big barrier to phage infection and phages have been shown to encode anti-CRISPR proteins and anti-restriction proteins to help them to overcome CRISPR-Cas immunity and restriction enzymes. And then thinking from the, the lysogenic point of view, when the phage is present as a prophage, as I mentioned, it, it's uh, good for it to encode genes that actually can increase bacterial host survival. And so one thing that phages commonly encode are proteins that provide resistance to further phage infection. And these can take many forms. My lab, we focus mostly on phages in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And so they commonly use the type 4 pilus as the cell surface attachment site. So phages frequently inhibit pilus assembly on the surface to protect the cell from further phage infection. There's super infection exclusion proteins, and sometimes uh, they have genes that change the antigen that's present on the surface of the cell, again, because that's commonly used as a site for phage attachment. But phages also encode lots of other genes, and sometimes these genes play really important roles in human diseases. So phages have been shown to encode genes that increase resistance to antibiotics, there's enzymes like staphylokinase that helps to disseminate uh, staph infections through the body, adhesins that allow uh, E. coli cells to adhere to our gut, effectors for type two and type three secretion systems. So, so there's a lot of these kinds of genes that phages encode. And again, when, you know, when people are sequencing new phages, what we typically find is that the vast majority of genes are genes of unknown function. And so they're, they're probably encoding genes that are, well, they're definitely encoding genes that are either required for, uh, you know, replication and overcoming host defenses or for improving bacterial fitness in some way. And so uh, quite a few years ago, back when Joe bondi Denemy was still a grad student in Toronto, he actually created a, a big collection of Pseudomonas aeruginosa phages uh, that my lab has continued to use. And, and we've been doing a lot of work characterizing the dark matter or the genes of unknown functions in these phages. So 
To create the collection, Joe took a set of Pseudomonas aeruginosa strains that we had in the lab. There were 88 strains and it was a very diverse collection. They were from both clinical and environmental sources. And what he did was he induced the resident prophages using mitomycin C, and then he plated those lysed cultures on lawns of 20 different Pseudomonas aeruginosa strains. And by doing this, he isolated about 90 different Pseudomonas phages. And we were interested in looking at how these phage genes or genes that are present in these uh, prophages actually could affect bacterial physiology. So the next thing that Joe did was to actually make prophages, make lysogenic strains of each of these phages he'd isolated in the same strain background. So we used the lab strain, PA14. And so we had a collection of different PA14s. Each one, the only difference was that it had a different prophage in it. And then Joe started to look at uh, what were the phenotypic effects that happened. And one of the first things he looked at was phage resistance. So um, what you're looking at here uh, on the left-hand side, there's about eight different Pseudomonas aeruginosa phages, and then uh, each square is a different lysogen. And what's really easy to see is that there are really different effects. So when we have a lysogen of JVD26, we see very strong resistance to a lot of the phages, uh, whereas a uh, lysogen of JVD62 over on the right, we see very little phage resistance. Joe also looked at uh, twitching motility. So this is a measure of type four pilus function. And again, he saw really uh, big variations. Some of the phages had very little effect on twitching motility and some of them had a very strong effect. And one of the other things he looked at was uh, virulence factor production. So uh, this blue green pigment in the bottom is pyocyanin and the, the red pigment is a phenazine. And so these are known virulence factors in human infections. And again, what he saw was that some of these lysogens actually had a very strong effect on production of these pigments. But the question remained, what, what are the genes that, that are causing these different bacterial phenotypes? And so we took the genomes of these phages and it ended up by selection in PA14, we ended up with a group of fairly uh, similar phages and they're, they're highly similar across their whole genome and we aligned them. So what you're looking at here is uh, five different phage genomes. Every arrow is an open reading frame. The arrows that are colored in dark gray are conserved genes of known function. And the ones that are colored in light gray are genes that are conserved among this group of phages, but are of unknown function. So hypotheticals, or some of them uh, have a really sort of poorly annotated function. But what we were most interested in were the variable genes. And sometimes these are called morons. Roger Hendricks came up with that term because they add more on the genome when they're there than when they're not. And so you can, you can see that the genes that are colored the same are homologs of each other. But what you can see is that while most of the genes in these phages are conserved and these, these phage genomes are about 60 genes, so they're very small, um, but they seem to have grabbed an assortment of these phage morons. And so these really were the genes that we zeroed in on because the variable effects we were seeing were almost certainly due to, the, to these genes. So what Joe did next was he uh, cloned all of these genes into uh, an expression plasmid, transformed them into PA14. So only a single gene was being expressed. And then again, looked at all the phenotypes and, and saw what, you know, what kind of effect was expression of, were expression of these genes having on the bacterial host. And what we found was that there was a really wide range of functions. And so we had genes that inhibited twitching motility. So they were blocking assembly of the type four pillus. We had some that uh, converted the serotype of the strain. We have some that increased biofilm formation. Quite a few of them uh, provide phage resistance, some of them at the cell surface, some of them intracellularly. And again, Joe discovered this group of genes the, in this single region 
these anti-CRISPR genes. So these genes are expressed really early in the phage life cycle and they allow the phage to overcome the CRISPR-Cas innate immune system. And so really the, the dark matter of phage genomes is giving us uh, you know, a, a huge pool of genes that have uh, possibly either potentially interesting biotechnological uses or important to know that they could be playing a role in human disease, or also with the phage resistance, important to know so we could identify them in strains that we're maybe trying to treat with phage therapy. And so I'm gonna zero in on one of the really interesting genes that uh, Joe discovered and you know, uh, one that we've done a lot of characterization on to try and figure out exactly how it's working. And this is a gene uh, found in phage DMS3. We call it AQS1 for anti-quorum sensing protein one. And what Joe discovered that was so exciting is that when he expressed this gene in PA14, so in, in Pseudomonas, it really upregulated production of pyocyanin. So this is a blue-green pigment that Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces. Um, and it's important for a couple of reasons. It's the terminal signaling molecule in the quorum sensing pathway. And it also is a really important virulence factor in human infections. And so when we saw this phenotype, it was, it was exciting and it was very striking. Joe also looked at twitching motility. And what he found was that expression of this gene totally blocked twitching motility. And it actually uh, led to phage resistance as well because to all phages that use the type 4 pillus. So because we uh, had noticed this pyocyanin phenotype and this potential link with quorum sensing, we were interested to see if other quorum mediated phenotypes were also affected by expression of this protein. So uh, we looked at a few other quorum mediated processes. So rhomnolipid production, protease production, and swarming motility, and we found that they all were also affected. And so this really pointed us in the direction that somehow this protein was disabling quorum sensing in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And so um, what is quorum sensing? So quorum sensing is a system that's present in bacteria that enables single cell organisms to behave more like a multicellular organism, and it allows the to control behaviors uh, as a group. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces signaling molecules and secretes them uh, into the environment. And at low cell density, the, the concentration of these quorum signaling molecules is very low, not many cells producing them. As cell density increases, you get accumulation of these quorum signals. And then at a, a specific trigger point, the cells all switch their behaviors at the same time. And in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, there's three quorum sensing systems and they're arranged in a hierarchical manner. So there's the LAS, the RHL and the PQS system. And as you can see, they're, they're very interrelated. So there's a lot of crosstalk between all of these systems. So because we had discovered that the expression of AQS1 led to overproduction of the terminal signaling molecule in quorum sensing, a postdoc in the lab at the time, Mega Shah, decided to look to see if she could find an interaction between AQS1 and some quorum sensing regulator. So she cloned uh, a number of these quorum sensing genes into a bacterial two hybrid uh, plasmid. And then she looked to see if she could find an interaction with AQS1. And what she found was that AQS1 bound to LASAR. LASAR is the master regulator of quorum sensing. It's at the very uh, top of the quorum sensing pathway. And so the ability of AQS1 to interact with LASAR and to uh, thereby inactivate it actually made sense with all of these phenotypes that we had seen. And so then that led, leads to the question, well, what, you know, why would bacteria or why would phages want to interrupt quorum sensing? Why would they want to block it? And it turns out that bacterial quorum sensing is actually used to control the expression of antiphage defenses. So it's energetically very costly for bacteria to produce, to have these antiphage defenses. And so at low cell density, when the danger of phage infection is low, 
Bacteria keep these systems uh, turned off or turned down, but at high cell density, when the risk of phage infection increases, they upregulate these systems. So some of the systems that have been shown to be controlled by quorum sensing are CRISPR-Cas systems. Um, quorum sensing has been shown to downregulate phage receptors on the cell surface and also to upregulate hemagglutinin protease production. And it's not exactly known uh, how that prevents phage infection. It's thought that it's secreted and, and maybe it degrades the tail fibers and, and it makes the phages not non-infectious. And so uh, we went on to solve the crystal structure of AQS1 with LASAR in collaboration with Trevor Murray's lab. And what we found is that a dimer of AQS1 that's shown in blue and cyan actually binds directly to the DNA binding domain of LASAR. And so in the cell at low cell density, uh, LASAR is present as a monomer and at high cell density, when the signaling molecule, uh, the quorum signaling molecule concentration increases uh, to a certain point, the ligand binding domain binds to the signal and it leads to dimerization and then that dimerization is actually what brings the two helix turn helix domains together and allows DNA binding. And so what we found is that within the dimer, uh, the active form of AQS or of LASR, there were two molecules, two dimers of AQS1, one bound to each of the DNA binding domains. And at the time that we solved this structure, there, had, there was no known structure for full length LASR. All there was uh, that had been determined was the, the ligand binding domain. But fortunately, a related quorum regulator, the TRA-R um, transcriptional regulator, had been solved in complex with DNA. And so they have similar ligand binding domains. Um, and so what we did was we used this TRA-R structure to overlay our DNA binding domain. And what we found is that they overlaid very well. And so in black is the DNA bound TRA-R, bound to TRA-R. And what you can see is AQS1 is, would totally block the ability um, of LASR to interact with DNA. So, so this was great. We had this, uh, this inhibitor of LASR and we looked to, at the other homologs that were present in these closely related phages. And one thing that really jumped out at us that DMS3, uh, AQS1, is only 69 amino acids, but the homologs in the other closely related phages, some of them had uh, an extra domain on the N terminus, and some of them had an extra domain on the C terminus. And so we were curious if these uh, homologs also had this, you know, bound to LASR and were, were interacting and inhibiting quorum sensing. And so uh, we cloned the homologs and then looked at them. We looked at pyocyanin production. And what we discovered is that only AQS1 has this pyocyanin overproduction. So it suggested to us that only AQS1 was interacting with LASR. And we confirmed that uh, through biochemical assays and, and bacterial two hybrid. We also noted that all three of those, uh, uh, of the homologs that we tested all maintained this twitching motility inhibition. And while we were working on this project, um, a paper came out that actually showed one of these homologs, the one from JBD26, actually interacts with pill B, the type four pillus assembly ATPase and prevents assembly from the, uh, of the pillus on the sur outer surface of the cell. And so, um, that we then tested AQS1 for interaction with pill B using BAC2 hybrid. And what we found was that it also interacts with pill B. And so then uh, the next thing we did was we mapped out the binding surfaces. And what we found is that AQS1 actually has two different interaction surfaces that it's interacting with LASAR and with pill B. So shown in red is this LASAR binding motif, YRDALD, and then uh, two residues, tryptophan 45 and phenylalanine 19 are uh, the spot where pill B interacts. And, you know, I think this is, this is pretty amazing. This res, this protein, I mean, is only 69 residues long and it's, it's uh, interacting with 
two really important molecules in Pseudomonas. And I think, I think there's a couple of important points here. One is that just because you find one interaction for one of these small proteins doesn't mean you've found it all. Um, and you know, we're doing further investigation here to try and figure out, is this dual interaction important? Is it maybe acting like a toggle switch that if LAS R is high, then it's being titrated away from pill B. Um, but I think the other important thing to note is that I think it really shows us how strong the evolutionary pressure is on phages. They have very constrained genome sizes. They have to fit in the capsid. They need to do a lot of things. And so DMS3 has taken this tiny little protein and evolved it to have two really important biological functions that are very advantageous for the phage. So the next thing we looked at um, is when AQS1 is expressed during the infection cycle. And um, it's found in the chromosome between the repressors and the transposase genes. So these genes are all expressed immediately on infection. And what we found is that AQS1, uh, as we expected from its genomic position, is expressed very rapidly when the phage infects a cell. And so what we think is happening um, is that this, this gene is likely playing uh, important roles both in the lytic cycle, so the initial infection event, but also we also know that it's expressed from the lysogen. And so you know, we know that it gets very rapidly transcribed when the phage enters the cell and it can interact with LASR. And what we think is happening is that this interaction with LASR may be a way for the phage to silence these antiphage defense systems. And it's similar to the anti-CRISPRs, they come in, they silence CRISPR-Cas, but this may be a, a mechanism by which the phage can actually silence a number of different systems simultaneously. So we also know that uh, AQS1 binds to pill B and prevents assembly from of the pillus on the cell surface. We know that this uh, is expressed from the lysogen. And so this provides the cell that has the prophage in it with increased resistance to further phage infection. And so, you know, um, sort of circling back to this uh, dark matter and leveraging viral impacts, I think that there's, you know, the study pre uh, presents innumerable uh, ways forward. So I think the, the dark matter of phage genomes probably has a lot of important biotechnological tools. So anti-CRISPRs are one example. Uh, people are doing a lot of work looking at other novel anti-phage defenses and you know who knows what the next CRISPR cast will be. We can also know that we, uh, we can use isolated phage proteins as antimicrobials. So phage lysins are a great example of this. Phage, phages uh, may have, uh, you know, they may have lots of other genes that could be used and, and co-opted as therapeutics in that way. I think knowing the functions of all of this dark matter in phage genomes will allow us to engineer phages to use in phage therapy. So in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we can include anti-CRISPRs, anti-restriction proteins, maybe AQS1 homologs to, to keep the, the uh, antiphage systems in the bacterial cell silenced. And I think in the long run, it will be very useful to know the functions of all these phage genes because it may actually allow us to, to target phage therapy better. So, I mean, genome sequencing is getting faster and cheaper all the time. And when human infections occur, uh, you know, if you sequence the genome of the phage or of the bacterial strain that's causing the infection, maybe at some point we'll actually be able to say, oh yeah, well, it has that phage resistance gene, so we have to use this panel of phages. And so, you know, really uh, being able to map out all of this dark matter will will allow us to improve phage therapy from that standpoint as well. And in conclusion, I'd just like to thank the people in the lab that did the work. Um, the AQS1 story was mostly done by uh, Veronique Taylor and Mega Shaw, two postdocs in my lab. Um, and it, as I mentioned, Joe did a lot of the groundwork for, these, for this work uh, back when he was a grad student. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Karen. That was a fantastic talk. Awesome.
uh, we have a, a few many few questions possibility can please enter your questions in the q a um, meanwhile i can ask you a couple of questions i have myself um, so considering that temperate phages are considered as you know if you're deleting the integrate gene can we use it for therapy and so on and so forth after looking at this so what what is your take on uh, we need to study all of them or how do we go about using them in a therapy yeah i mean i think i think it's a good question and you know people people are using lytic phages a lot but a lot of you know, you can get horizontal gene transfer among lytic phages as well. And I think, I, I think they're also carrying potentially all of these virulent genes and things that increase biofilm formation. So, you know, it's, uh, they, they don't integrate the same way, but there's no reason that they can't recombine with prophages in the chromosome. And human pathogens typically are quite enriched for prophages. I mean, yeah, the E. coli 0157H7, shiga toxin, it's, it's almost 20% horizontally transferred elements, predominantly prophages. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential for recombination. And, you know, I think also um, possibly engineering these very small phages that aren't carrying very many things around, if we can actually really well characterize every gene that's in there and take out ones we don't know anything about that it it presents yeah. a, a more manageable uh target for phage therapy i think yeah absolutely i mean we, we need to be careful about which what we are using for therapy yeah. uh we have a question do you have a sense of how many of these unknown phage genes have multiple functions like aqs1 rather than a single impact i potentially all of them. Uh, no. <laughs> and I wouldn't even, uh, I wouldn't bet that AQS1 doesn't have a third function potentially. Um, you know, I think, I, so anti-CRISPRs are another good example of dual functionality. There are anti-CRISPRs that have been shown to, uh, that to disable both the type 1E and the type 1F CRISPR-Cas system. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're totally different systems. So I think, I think potentially a lot of these phage genes could have multiple functions. Yeah, uh, we have one more question here. Um, what are your thoughts on engineering phages with appropriate host ranges for a therapy versus finding lytic phages in the wild that can do the same thing? Yeah, so, so I, think, I think the way forward is engineering phages. I know people have typically um, been uh, a little reluctant because there, I think there was a, a general feeling that um, it would be hard to get approval for engineered phages, definitely. Uh, and, you know, Graham Hatful's group uh, engineered, uh, they had a, a lysogenic phage that they knocked out the repressor and engineered it to be uh, lytic. And so, you know, that really set the stage for being able to engineer phages and still use them. And it does, it gives me pause to think about just isolating random phages out of the environment and using them. In some cases, they're not even sequenced. And so you don't, you don't really know what's going to happen. And, and, you know, it's the, what people sometimes think are lytic phages may not be lytic phages. So with these with these JBD phages, we can plate them across a panel of Pseudomonas aeruginosa strains. Sometimes the plaques are really uh, turbid. Sometimes the plaques are incredibly clear. And you would think from looking at plaque morphology that they're not temperate, but they are. So do you I, think that is a, do you think that is a conditional, like some sort of condition impacting the lysogeny or lytic when they it, test it? Yeah, I, I, it's it's hard to say. We haven't we haven't investigated that. Um, you know, I think there could be. I think it could just be in some phages the background level of spontaneous induction is much higher. Maybe maybe in some strains it's higher. Definitely, we know uh, again with these JBD phages that are all really closely related. When we make lysogens in PA fourteen and then grow those cells overnight, we see spontaneous induction of anywhere from 10 to the fourth per mil up to like 10 to the ninth per mil. 
And you know, these things are all really closely related. It's the same strain background. Why are we seeing you know, 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth magnitude of difference of spontaneous induction? Yeah, that's fascinating, fascinating. Uh, we have one more question from Kelly. It was surprising to see a conserved insertion sequence in all of those phages, or do you do these use transposes as integrases? Oh yeah, so they, um, yeah, so they do, they're mu-like phages, so they use transposition for replication, yeah. Okay. Um, so have you, in your work, have you come across a prophage or temperate phage, which is, uh, expresses a gene that you think maybe not giving a benefit to the bacteria, maybe, but it is expensive, maybe, probably, or toxic for a bacteria. Is it, do you think there is a possibility of that? Or maybe they drop it off later? Yeah, no, I think, I think there's definitely a possibility of that. And, you know, again, I think there's probably going to be, um, strain specific differences that what, what may be really costly in one Pseudomonas aeruginosa strain is not in another. Cool. Yeah. That is all I have, I think here. This is a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. So everyone, uh, we have a follow-up session coming up. Simon, do you have any announcements? No, that's pretty much it. Let me share my screen so that we can show the link, but you should have it in the email. Um, again, to reiterate what Vivek just said, but these were fantastic talks again. Thank you all uh, presenters. And yeah, this was really great to just see all this potential application of the phages.